Good evening. Welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I want to um, welcome everybody on behalf of the Pakistan Initiative. My name is Sabah Mahmood. I teach anthropology here at uh, Berkeley. I'm also a coordinator with Munis Farooqi, who couldn't be here, unfortunately, today, of both the Pakistan Initiative and the Urdu Initiatives. Um, so, welcome. Um, I just want to say a few words. First of all, um, this event is sponsored by both the Berkeley uh, Pakistan Initiative as well as the Organization of Pakistani Entrepreneurs of North America. Many of you might have heard of it. It goes by the uh, acronym OPEN. And of course, the Department of English, which is why we have this beautiful room. Um, now, just a quick word about some of the upcoming events at the Center for South Asian Studies. Um, we have some really excellent lineup in this semester. We have Romila Thapar coming, Ram Guha, Sunita Narayan, Dipesh Chakraborty, and Diana Eck. And then we also will be screening uh, The Ship of Theseus, a film which is an organ donation in, in South Asia. So we hope that you will be able to get the program, which is sitting right back over there and come to the rest of the events. Now, just a very short introduction about what the Pakistan Initiative is, the, for those of you who don't know about it. Um, so Pakistan Initiative was launched in October 2013. Our, our inaugural address was given by no less than Asma Jahangir, who came and um, actually opened uh, the initiative, launched the initiative. Since then, um, we have had uh, the Habib Foundation uh, endow uh, Habib Distinguished Lecture Series, uh, where we will be hosting at least a couple of talks every year on Pakistan, bringing people from Pakistan to come and uh, talk about issues, cultural, political issues here on Berkeley uh, campus. Then we also have been very successful in establishing what is now known as the Sayyid Sharifuddin Pirzada Dissertation Prize. It's an annual prize for the best doctorate um, dissertation produced with a focus on Pakistan in all of the social sciences and in law and in the humanities, and it's going to be starting this upcoming uh, academic year. And then finally, one of the best news that we have received in a long time is that we have been able to launch our Bullpip uh, Urdu program. As you know, that the Berkeley Urdu program uh, was one of the very first ones to be established almost. Over 20 years ago, Berkeley hosted it. It was for the study of Urdu and Lahore. When things got rough in Pakistan, the State Department shut it down, but we have been actually able to revive it in cooperation with Lums University in Lahore. So we will be starting to do that as well this coming summer, and we are very, very excited about that. We have we received over a million dollars to be able to uh, continue this program for the next five years. And then finally, other highlights. We just recently hosted Muhammad Hanif, who was actually here, and many of you, I saw you there. We had a wonderful conversation. And then we will also be screening the film Kala Pul, uh, which is going to be shown uh, very soon. Anyway, so this is just the highlight of the Pakistan Initiative. I want to hand over uh, the mic to the person who will be facilitating the conversation today. It happens to be Professor Harsha Ram. Um, Harsha is an associate professor in the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures in the Department of Comparative Literature, and he's also affiliated with the Department of Italian Studies. He commands a number of different genres. His uh, interests, uh, research interests span Russian and comparative European Romanticism. He also has worked on in Italian literature, and Indian literature, on Georgian literature. And most interestingly, I just wanted to give you a sense of what he writes. So his most recent book is The Imperial Sublime, A Russian Poetics of Empire, which was published in 2003. And then he has another book project, which is entitled Crossroads to Modernity, Aesthetic, Modernism, and the Russian-Georgian Encounter. And then he has a third book project, which is called Poetry and Power. Harsha is going to be, I know I can go on, but I won't. Uh, you want to really, you're here to hear somebody else. So I'm going to introduce Harsha Ram to you, and then he is going to take it from there. So thank you again for coming. It's really a pleasure to see you all here. Thank you, Sabah. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, of course. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here for so many reasons, as a literary scholar, as a um, as someone who's also looking for novels, not just to read, but also to teach our students. And I cannot think of a more timely uh, author in so many ways, whose books could fit into so many uh, 
capacious, uh, under so many capacious rubrics and into so many syllabuses as the three novels of uh, Mohsin Hamid. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Mohsin Hamid was born in 1971 in Lahore. He grew up mostly in Pakistan, but spent part of his childhood in California and returned to America to attend Princeton University and Harvard Law School. He then worked in, Calif in New York and London as a management consultant before returning to Lahore to pursue writing full time. His first novel, Moth Smoke, published in 2000, which I think many of you will have read with a great deal of uh, delight, uh, tells the story of an ex-banker and heroin addict, though I think he was more of a pot smoker than a heroin addict, <laughs> um, in contemporary Lahore. It was, though it's true that the heroin must have pushed him over the edge of the edge, right? uh, It was published in 14 languages and became a cult hit in Pakistan as well as elsewhere, where it was made into a, into a telefilm. It was also the winner of a Betty Trask Award and a finalist for the Penn Hemingway Award. His second novel, uh, The Reluctant Fundamentalist of 2007, recounted a Pakistani man's abandonment of his high-flying life in New York City. Published in over 30 languages, it has become a million-copy international bestseller. It won the Ambassador Book Award, the Ainsfield Wolf, Wolf Book Award, the Asian American Literary Award, and the South Bank Show Award for Literature, and was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize. The Guardian named it one of those books that defined the decade. A 2013 film of The Reluctant Fundamentalist by Oscar-nominated director Mira Nair, about whom perhaps we shall also have a chance to speak, starred uh, Riz Ahmed, Liev Schreiber, Kate Hudson, and Kiefer Sutherland. His third novel, which uh, perhaps some of you have already caught up with, I certainly did over the last week or two, is entitled, uh, has the colorful title of How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, published in 2013. It is um, uh, an exploration of mass urbanization and global economic transformation, but it is also a love story in the apparent guise of a self-help book. It was shortlisted for the DSC Prize and published to exceptional critical acclaim. In the words of Michiko Kakutani of the New York Times, with How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, Mr. Hamid reaffirms his place as one of his generation's most inventive and gifted writers. Mohsin's essays and short stories have also appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, The New Yorker, uh, Granta, Time, The Washington Post, I could go on and on. And he has also lectured at dozens of universities around the world, from Stanford and Yale to the London School of Economics and the National University of Singapore. In 2013, a foreign policy magazine named him nothing less than one of the world's 100 leading global thinkers. Uh, it's my great pleasure, therefore, to welcome Mohsin Hamid. Uh, we're going to be sitting, I think, uh, 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 at the podium. We're going to have a conversation. Uh, uh, and I, I believe that... Uh, uh, Mohsin would also like to read from his most recent novel, and we're also, of course, going to be entertaining questions uh, from the audience. Please welcome uh, Mohsin Hamid. So, Mohsin, I want to begin with some um, very general questions about your, your life and work. Um, and I couldn't help thinking that so many of your works seem to straddle something, so a certain kind of binary opposition that gets in some ways both explored but also undermined. Um, and I think it's fair to say that Beyond the very considerable artistic merits of your novels, and certainly we're going to talk about them, your success as a writer has been based on one principal factor, which is on the firstly making Pakistan visible to itself, to the people of Pakistan, but also to a larger, game, a larger global audience at a time when the country occupies a kind of crucial geopolitical fault line in the world uh, in, in this revival of the great game that we've been witnessing over the past few decades. So I think it's fair to say that both your life and your work has really been in some ways about um, this conflicted dialogue between what we might call East and West. And so let me begin by asking you the first question. How do you see this dialogue uh, yourself? Is it about speaking truth to power? Is it about bridging the gap? Or is it about simply exposing the gap in all its uh, yawning uh, abyss and just showing us, as great writers do, that this is something we need to think about. So, what do you feel about this, this, this question of, of this binarism, this East and West that seems to be so much a part of our lives these days? Um, well, first of all, uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you all for coming on this gorgeous, uh, sunny uh, California uh, evening. Uh, I'm, I'm honored and also impressed that you've decided to spend part of it uh, here this evening with us. Um, in terms of the you know binary oppositions and these uh, East versus West and you know Pakistan um, versus international views of Pakistan, uh, I guess you know for me, um, I uh, I don't entirely believe in these divisions. Mm -hmm. 
um, I'm not a big believer really in, in countries or um, you know religious groups or uh, even you know races and genders as being any kind of cohesive thing. Mm. I think that all the groups that we look at um, are a bit like clouds. So from a distance, they seem to be a single mass. When you zoom in, it's a it's a you know a constellation of little particles. And um, I think partly the reason why I feel this way is because uh, I myself am personally you know so uh, uh, well. Initially, I would have said split between um, you know identities, but now I tend to think. Um, just uncomfortably smudged across, you know, uh, uh, identities. Um, so, you know, when I was, uh, in a sense, I have no first language. Mm -hmm. I was born in Lahore, and when I was three years old, I came not far from here to Eskinder village on the campus of Stanford University, where my father was a university professor then, and is still a university professor now, um, uh, was, was beginning his PhD at Stanford. So my mother, myself, my dad, we moved to California. And um, a few days after we moved in, I was a fluent Urdu speaker, and spoke Punjabi and Urdu. Uh, I started talking very early. By one, I was chattering away. <laughs> and by three, you know, I, I was, I was uh, quite, um, you know, uh, quite a talker. <laughs> and my mother heard crying in the, in the, she was in the kitchen. And she stepped out to find me in front of the townhouse next to our townhouse. Mm -hmm. And they all look identical, these graduate student townhouses on Stanford University campus. And, uh, and I was in front of the wrong one. Uh, and the neighbor was looking down at this little Pakistani boy who was looking up at him, both baffled. Um, I was crying, and I was surrounded by a group of young children. You know, and as I'm sure is still the case on Berkeley or Stanford campuses, it's a multi-ethnic, multi-international group of children. But they all spoke English, and they were surrounding me, uh, three-year-old me. And my mother came out and they said, what's wrong with him? And she said, there's nothing wrong with him. And so why can't he speak? Is he retarded? <laughs> and she said, no, he's not retarded. He, just, he can speak. He just doesn't speak English. Mm -hmm. And after that, I came back into the house. And apparently, I'm told, I didn't speak again for a month. Yes. And uh, which, you know, for me, not speaking for five minutes was quite unusual. <laughs> so my mother was very worried. My father was very worried. My mother said we should take him to a doctor. My father said, no, no, he'll be OK. And a month later, you know, when I started to speak, I, I may not even help you, okay, but uh, uh, a month later I did begin to speak. And I was speaking in you know, English in full sentences with an American accent. Mm -hmm. And six years later, we moved back to Pakistan again. I was nine years old. And it was only when we moved back to Pakistan that my parents discovered that I had completely forgotten Urdu. And so at the age of nine, I had to relearn Urdu, and then of course, you know, in Pakistan studied at least partly in Urdu, but in an English medium school, so most of my education was in English, but relearned Urdu. Um, but now Urdu, my first language, had become my third language. English was my second language, mm -hmm. uh, but it's my best language. And my first language, which is the original Urdu I was born with, has kind of vanished. And I came back to America, and then went back to Pakistan, and lived in Europe and all over. And I think, you know, I, uh, I am somebody who can fake being um, an insider in many, many places, you know, New York, London, mm -hmm. Lahore, but never fully believes it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and when I was younger, the, the impulse to try to fit in wherever I was was very strong. Now that I'm older, um, I find that I'm much more comfortable with myself as a perennial <coughs> misfit. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an advantage because I suspect that everybody actually feels like a misfit. And even people who've lived their entire lives in Berkeley or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I think that, that uh, uh, you know, we think of cross-cultural and whatever, but what often we forget is that, you know, every human being is a migrant. If you were born in Berkeley, let's say 80 years ago, and you live in Berkeley today, mm -hmm. um, you've migrated through time. The Berkeley of 1934 doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. The friends who went to school with you don't, you may, maybe don't live here anymore, but you don't live. Uh, the ice cream truck that you bought ice cream with is gone. So mm -hmm. I think human experience is actually one of migration. So to your question about Pakistan, interpreting Pakistan, I try to apply the same vantage point to really any question that I'm presented with, mm -hmm. which is to be deeply skeptical of, of group identities and to um, try to you know, humanize, and also to try to sort of recomplicate what's been oversimplified wherever possible.
That's great. I mean, like all writers, you answered a difficult question with a story, your own story, <laughs> right? And I, I just wanted to pick up a few of the strands of that story. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, it's about the, the loss of origins, in a sense, right? It's about losing Urdu and then never really regaining it except through the medium or the mediation of English. It's about moving around. It's about, I think, instead of fixed identities, fluid identities, hybrid identities, uh, and it seems to me that that's a condition, as you said, that's increasingly shared by a lot of people in this audience, and many people not just in Berkeley but elsewhere. Um, maybe another way of phrasing the same question I had, which is really not about, I admit, East and West. I think that's, I think we we sort of outgrew that in 1947 or, or at some point in the past. But could it be then about the local versus the global? Here's another opposition that I want to suggest for you. That is to say, you're someone whose life and work has been very much about uh, mediating between certain local spaces and a, and, a, and a radically globalized world. Right? So that, and on the one hand, this is something I think that is very common to diasporic uh, immigrant communities. And so I think this is a story that would be familiar to many people in this audience and elsewhere. On the other hand, it's, I think, unique to get writers to focus on this in, in a new and compelling way, rather than just simply as the immigrant story. Uh, and it's, in fact, interesting to me that none of your stories are really about immigrants, are, are not really immigrant stories. They're actually about shuttling back and forth, in the case of the reluctant fundamentalist, and to some extent even moth smoke. Um, or about a very different kind of story that I'm sure we'll come to with, with your last novel. So maybe another way of thinking about it is this, this sort of movement between the local and the global, which again, I think you don't have to even leave your country or city to experience. I think your last novel, for example, is very much about a, a local city that at the same time is a kind of stand-in for a vast uh, process that is actually worldwide. So. Could that be a kind of a, a, a way into your world, this, this local, global uh, connection? I mean, I think, yes, in, in the sense that um, uh, I'm not so comfortable with notions of, of immigration or emigration, because when you use those words, you know, immigrant or you know, emigrant... It suggests a final destination. Well, it, it suggests a final destination. It also suggests that either one of those places is the vantage point from which the person should be examined. So I'm much more comfortable with the idea of migrants mm -hmm. uh, than of immigrants. And, and in my own case, it's partly because, as opposed to being a one-way traveler who's come to America, I've come to America, I've gone back to Pakistan, come to America, I've gone to Europe, gone to Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it, it hasn't been a one-way thing for me. Mm -hmm. But I think increasingly for many people in the world, it's not a one-way thing. And um, uh, so migration is very important uh, to me. You know, both temporal and geographic and cultural. But um, to your, you know, to your question about uh, um, uh, the notion of the local versus the global, uh, I feel quite strongly that um, that the centrality of any place can be equally claimed. Mm -hmm. So, so it needn't be, you know. So, in my latest novel, as you mentioned, I'm sure we'll talk about more later, mm -hmm. but. You know, uh, uh, the idea was that um, I wanted to write a book about the city mm -hmm. because, you know, a billion people in the next decade or two will move to the city. Yes. Uh, migration in, in Asia and Africa, which is, which is, you know, tens of times bigger than international migration. We hear about, Absolutely. you know, young Latin Americans moving to, uh, you know, Anglophone North America, so mm -hmm. to speak. But, but the truth is those movements are tiny. You know, people moving from rural Punjab to Lahore or from rural, you know, Khairul Khatun to Karachi, mm -hmm. are such a bigger scale, yes. and um, and so and so, I, you know, those migrants and and that's the new cities that are growing up, these mega cities of you know Shanghai and, and Beijing and, and you know, Bombay and Delhi and Lahore and Karachi, and, you know, Caracas and Lagos and Sao Paulo, and all these places, mm -hmm. Johannesburg. Um, I wanted to write about about this urban environment, mm -hmm. and so I wanted to posit this notion that instead of writing about some exotic place, Lahore, mm -hmm. why don't I write about the city mm -hmm. and use Lahore as the template mm -hmm. for the city? You know, why is it that you can write about, for example, New York and say this is a novel about the city? Mm -hmm. Or you can write about Paris and say this is the novel about the city. Why can't you equally say this is Lahore and it is the city? You know, perhaps there are more cities in the world like Lahore today than there are like New York. 
Um, and so, uh, uh, and so, in that sense, I would say um, the local versus global, um, you know, uh, 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 debate or, or bifurcation. I tend to see it less as um, two ends of a spectrum, mm -hmm. that here is local and there is global, mm -hmm. but rather that we have a kind of circle, yes. and, uh, and if you touch the local, mm -hmm. you're part of a continuum which includes the global. Yes. And so whether it's representing Lahore as a you know, pot smoking, you know, sex having, uh, uh, adulterous, heroin using, you know, den of sin, um, you know, very noirish kind of, uh, you know, Tarantino-esque uh, vision. Um, but why not? Uh, well, why does Lahore have to stand for, you know, some notion of how Lahore is different from all the cities? Uh, so yeah, I, I would say that, 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 that it's that global and local, maybe not global versus local. In fact, I mean, just taking, uh, continuing your train of thought, it seems to me that the city, and particularly the megalopolis or the megacity, is precisely the place where the local and the global can meet and touch in complex and contradictory ways. Because on the one hand, the city is the place of, uh, the quintessential expression of the modern or even the postmodern. On the other hand, it's very clear that the pre-modern, the non-modern, the traditional, uh, the, the recently urbanized rural populations that are streaming into these megalopolises all over Asia, that, that this is actually a place of sharp and contradiction where, where impossible contradictions actually converge and meet and collide, yes? Um, and so in that sense, it's not a coincidence to me that all three novels that you've written are really, in many ways, city books. But perhaps it's your most recent novel, How to Get uh, Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, that really focuses on the city in a particularly pronounced way. Um, I actually want to invite you to read from the novel now, um, and then perhaps we could, we could continue talking about it once the uh, audience gets a sense of, uh, of, of its style and its energy and its, and its, and its themes. Okay. Shall I do it down here? Whatever you'd like, actually. Um, Whatever you're comfortable with. It might be easier not to hold the whole show mic. So I'm going to read from the beginning of How to Get Your Theory to Rising Asia, just the first couple of pages, to give you a sense of, of how it works and what it sounds like. I won't do much of an introduction to it because we're going to now have a conversation about it. Um, I'll just read. This is how it begins. Just one thing. Do you think we can shut that door uh, or uh, do you think it will be exclusionary? To no, not at all. Okay, fine. <laughs> Unless you're writing one, a self-help book is an oxymoron. You read a self-help book so someone who isn't yourself can help you. That someone <laughs> being the author. This is true of the whole self-help genre. It's true of how-to books, for example. And it's true of personal improvement books, too. Some might even say it's true of religion books. But some others might say that those who say that should be pinned to the ground and bled dry with a slow slice of a blade across their throats. So it's wiser simply to note a divergence of views on that subcategory and move swiftly on. None of the foregoing means self-help books are useless. On the contrary, they can be useful indeed. But it does mean that the idea of self in the land of self-help is a slippery one. And slippery can be good. Slippery can be pleasurable. Slippery can provide access to what would chafe if entered dry. This book is a self-help book. Its objective, as it says on the cover, is to show you how to get filthy rich in rising Asia. And to do that, it has to find you. Huddled, shivering, on the packed earth under your mother's cot, one cold, dewy morning. Your anguish is the anguish of a boy whose chocolate has been thrown away, whose remote controls are out of batteries, whose scooter is busted, whose new sneakers have been stolen. This is all the more remarkable, since you've never in your life seen any of these things. The whites of your eyes are yellow, a consequence of spiking bilirubin levels in your blood. The virus afflicting you is called hepatitis E. Its typical mode of transmission is fecal oral. Yum. It kills only about one in 50, so you're likely to recover. But right now, you feel like you're going to die. Your mother has encountered this condition many times, or conditions like it anyway. So maybe she doesn't think you're going to die. Then again, maybe she does. Maybe she fears it. 
Everyone is going to die. And when a mother like yours sees in a third-born child like you the pain that makes you whimper under her cot the way you do, maybe she feels your death push forward a few decades, take off its dark, dusty headscarf, and settle with open-haired familiarity and a lascivious smile into this, the single mud-walled room she shares with all of her surviving offspring. What she says is, don't leave us here. Thank you, Marcin. Um, it's, it's a beautiful beginning to a very rich and, and complex book, and I read it over the last few weeks, and I very much uh, enjoyed it and, and, and appreciated it. I wanted to start with a very general observation, which is some of the differences that I observed between this last book and the previous two. And one that really struck me, and I struck a couple of other readers whom I spoke to, was that while the uh, first two novels have a very precise sense of historical and geographical location. So for example, uh, Not Smoke is set in uh, Pakistan around 1988, yes, when Pakistan becomes a nuclear power. Uh, and similarly, um, The Reluctant Fundamentalist very much hovers around the before and after that watershed event, which is 9-11. So in a sense, one can very easily situate your first two novels at a very particular moment, both in Pakistani history and in the history of Pakistan's relations with the world. Uh, this novel, How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, is, I would say, deliberately imprecise. That is to say, you have suppressed for much of the novel any references to, any immediate references to Pakistani time, space, reality, except that it can be discerned through sort of indirect you know, references to beards and to a distant city by the sea, which one can assume is Karachi and so forth. So I'm curious, this. I mean, it's part of, may, I think, the, the, the evolution of many writers to go from what they, uh, to, from a particular story to a vaster canvas. Um, but the way you move from the particular to the general is very unique to you because it's at the same time a book that's deeply rooted in a specific experience of helter skelter South Asian urbanization, and specifically Pakistani urbanization. Uh, and yet, at the same time, it's a universal story. So I'm curious to know how you, you know, move from, I mean, did you choose to suppress those details? And how you, what you thought that suppressing specificity might give you in terms of a kind of larger vision, whether it's of Asia or of globalism or whatever? Um, I, I, did, I did do it on purpose, the, the suppression of the, of the, you know, the names in particular. Um, and I mean, there are a bunch of different reasons uh, for it, I'll, 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 three immediately come to mind. You know, one reason was um, I felt that to write about Pakistan for myself, um, how am I going to do this? Pakistan has been so much written about with a particular, you know, war on terror lens of late, and I've been reading, of course, what other people are writing about Pakistan. I live there, and I read the newspaper, and, and just the word Pakistan. You know, it's like it's like sort of Friday the Thirteenth. You know, it, 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 it's, not, it's not just a date. You know, it's like a, it's it's become like a horror franchise. And so and so similarly, you know, you say Pakistan, uh, it, it you know carries this whole thing. Um, and similarly with Islam or with you know many other words that you could use, um, they they come pre-coded. And I thought, how do I write about this for myself? You know, without using these words that have been encoded for me and for others. How do I see this with my own eyes? And so one way to do that for me was to take all these words out. Just describe what is going on. And then whether it's Pakistan or not Pakistan, Islam or not Islam or whatever it is about, it will just be what it is. Um, and I think in a way it's useful because names are themselves deceptive. You know, once we start naming uh, you know, religions, countries, groups, um, we, we quickly forget that we've just used a kind of shorthand to describe possibly disparate objects. Um, and we think we've, we're speaking a, a truth about those objects. Um, I think it's easier to just discard the shorthand and just talk about the objects. So uh, uh, that was one reason to do it, to, to write about Pakistan for myself. Um, the other reason is a bit what we talked about before, which is uh, the notion that you know, uh, any place can be universal. But in this novel in particular, I want to blur the boundary between the characters of the novel, mm -hmm. and the reader of the novel, mm -hmm. and the writer of the novel. Yes. And so, for example, if the main character's mother's name, let's say it was my mother's name, mm -hmm. and if that mother, was, uh, that mother character were to die in the novel, um, you know, for a reader it would be a character with this name, die. But if 
the character has no name and is simply your mother, because the main, main character is you. To read about your mother dying, described as your mother dying, has a different feeling, a different resonance. Mm. And so it helps to blur that boundary between reader and character, and we can talk a whole mm. long conversation. And then I guess the third thing is, um, uh, partly I thought to myself that it's clear that a degree of self-censorship takes place everywhere in the world. Um, uh, and I think, uh, uh, you know, that's normal. You know, you don't, when you're walking down the street in, in Berkeley and you see, you know, two young hoodlums, you know, vandalizing a car, you might think in your head, you know, stop it, you know, you behave yourself or, you know, <laughs> cease and desist or whatever you're thinking in your mind, <laughs> you know, get lost. Um, I'm going to kick your ass. I mean, whatever you're thinking in your, in your mind, but you don't say it. There's a degree of self-censorship, stroke, self-preservation which takes place. And that, of course, is true not just of your day-to-day -day life, but it's, a true to, it's a true of fiction. You know, one might not write certain racist or, you know, pedophiliac or whatever other tendencies that you want to manifest in your fiction because of a perception of how you'll be perceived. Mm -hmm. Now, in Pakistan, and I think in many countries, um, probably in almost every country, but, but in Pakistan, I feel quite strongly that there are, there are certain topics which are very dangerous to touch. And so, you know, self-censorship is going on constantly. Mm -hmm. Now, in an environment of self-censorship as a writer, um, what is the way that you navigate that? Uh, you know, one of the ways of navigating it is you try to get around it, of mm -hmm. course, uh, which is what Sufi poets have been doing forever. Instead of writing simple essays saying that, you know, you and God have a unity between you, know, um, which, which got al Haraj and others killed, they decided to go for poetry and other sorts of you know, metaphorical interpretation, as did you know, uh, Jewish mystics and, and mystics and Hindu. I mean, every religion has this similar sorts of thing. Um, so one is to do that. Mm -hmm. But I think the other part of it is to be aware of self-censorship. The most pernicious self-censorship is when it's internalized to the point that you are self-censoring without being aware of self-censoring. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's not that just that you're keeping your mouth shut, but you think that you're not keeping your mouth shut. You think you're saying what you want to say, um, and the sort of, a, sort of a, the, the Stockholm syndrome of self-censorship. You know that that I didn't want to say that or anything else. Um, that I think is very very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Self-censorship I understand, but but internalizing the self-censorship is is I think very dangerous for a writer. The most dangerous thing. And so for me, also using no names. It was a bit like presenting forward a, a newspaper where all of the redactions are left as black, black, like you know, sharpie marks on the page of the of the newspaper, as opposed to having shown you the edited version of the newspaper, which has had the censorship take place, mm. um, but you don't have any trace of it. So that was, I guess, a third important reason for myself was to say, look, um, if I take away country, religion, everything else, mm -hmm. um, uh, partly it allows me to speak more freely, but partly. It allows me to remind myself constantly that I cannot speak entirely for you. Thank you. That was a very rich answer. I mean, it, it strikes me that as someone who actually works a lot in Russian literature, and Russia is a country that at least until very recently had has had far less creative freedom than even Pakistan, that um, self censorship, what, we, what some people call indirection, that is to say, we're of circumventing direct speech or direct, uh, a direct address to authority can actually be in a peculiar way extremely productive. And it, it can be actually a form of creativity if the right symbols, metaphors, narrative strategies are adopted. Uh, the, and, and, but the question is what level of lucidity you're adopting those literary strategies and if it's simply a, a form of capitulation or not. And I think in your case, by bracketing nationality and religion, which are the two big sort of bugbears of Pakistan in most countries for that matter, You've touched at something that I think is actually quite universal in this in the story, and I, I certainly want to come back to that later, the universality of it. But before that, I, I noticed I, I watched I, I cheated a little bit and I watched an interview on YouTube, uh, a conversation between you and an Indian American writer, Akhil Sharma, and I was delighted. This is this is the the literature professor in me was delighted to find how thoughtful and articulate you're about questions of structure and how you actually put your stories together. And that's something I think that you know, readers don't always think about. They, they, sort of, they sort of appreciate and absorb the structure as it is without thinking about how it's actually all put together. And this novel, of course, this last novel is, of course, at least on the surface, a self-help book, 
right? And that was in fact addressed briefly in the two pages that you read. And I came up with a couple of ideas about why and for what purposes this strategy was adopted by you as a genre. And here are a couple of them. First of all, A, it's a clever marketing strategy that I'm sure has helped increase sales of your book. Uh, B, it's a spoof, of course it is. Uh, a highly intelligent literary parody of self-help books that ultimately points in a very different direction and to a very different set of life lessons. And three, if the book is helping anyone, it's actually helping you, first of all, and as you acknowledge. It's helping you think about how to write. But it's also, and here I think the reader comes in, it's also allowing the reader to insert him or herself into the lives of the protagonist so that they're themselves implicated. Right? So it's, it's carving out a, a very different relationship between reader, writer, and hero, which I think is very different from your previous novels. But I was wondering if you want to talk a little bit more about why self-help, what is self-help, and what kind of, in a sense, literary trick you're trying to, to pull off here. You know, I think that, um, uh, well, A, B, and C are all very interesting. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, A, the, the, the uh, marketing benefit has probably backfired spectacularly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, a, lot of, a lot of people were saying, you know, uh, they were, that, uh, people were saying, you know, I, I, uh, a friend of mine recommended I read the book, so I finally did. I was really reluctant because I didn't want to be seen on the subway holding how to get filthy rich and nice. Looking like a total, you know, corporate tool. Um, so I think my, my, my you know, my, my uh, hipster subsegment was estranged by, uh, by, the, by that particular marketing tool. But, um, uh, so I, but yeah, no, but I think in a sense, yes, all of the above perhaps are, have different elements of... Uh, uh, the one that's most interesting to me is is the one about um, uh, you know uh, in a sense that it actually is a self help book. Mm -hmm. But I but I would step back further and say that I think perhaps all novels are self help books. Um, first of all, uh, you know why do you write a novel? It's a pretty bizarre thing. I and mean, my my working life consists of sitting by myself in a room for hours at a time for years. Just making stuff up quietly. You know? <laughs> that's that's a very weird thing to do. I mean, you know, I'm 42 years old. I've got two kids. I'm married. I'm you know I'm, I function in the world. I've had jobs, and yet I insist on spending a big chunk of my waking life sitting staring at a wall you know, for years um, and writing down whatever comes to me. Now, surely something is being served by doing this. Um, you know, despite, despite uh, anything you might have heard to the contrary, you know, normal writing is not the most lucrative or secure of professions. Um, nobody does it because of the, you know, the, the promise of, of riches or uh, 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 anything of that sort. Um, it, there's, some, there's some deeper itch that's being scratched. So I think there is something that requires it. But also, why do we read novels? Um, to me, that's also very interesting. And so, you know, is there some degree of self-help in the act of reading a novel? And I think that what began as a kind of joke, a parody, um, it, as I began to explore the idea, it became actually quite serious and hopefully by the end of the novel very sincere. Um, I think the novel begins in a more cynical, parodic tone than it ends. Absolutely. And, um, and so, and so, um, uh, now, I think one of the fundamental differences between um, self-help as it's normally described and, and self-help as it interests me um, is that generally speaking, self-help literature and self, and even if you don't read self-help books, every newspaper magazine you open is full of self-help. You know, how to have six-pack abs and how to live to 150 and, you know, how to, you know, give him or her, you know, thousands of orgasms. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, uh, so it's all effectively like narcissistic. Mm. What's a little bit more interesting, though, I think, and perhaps more useful, is as opposed to narcissistic self-reinforcing strategies, which are in the end um, ultimately doomed because the self will cease. Mm. You will die. Mm. And so a, a self-reinforcing strategy um, runs up against mortality and makes mortality that much more terrifying. Mm. Um, so therefore, we have had throughout human history attempts at self-mitigation strategies. 
to make the self less important, less real, less significant. Um, and very often these have taken the form of artistic activities and or religious activities. Um, so whether it's Sufi poetry or Zen koans or you know the tradition of any other, and every religion has its you know, mystical side. Um, this notion of, of self-mitigation, self-transcendence, mm -hmm. is very interesting. And when we read a novel, I think there is some transcendence of the self that occurs. Mm -hmm. As a reader, suddenly you're in somebody else's story. Mm -hmm. And who is the you who's in somebody else's story exactly? You know, who is Mosin? Well, you know, do I really exist? I'm, I'm sort of a, you know, there's a biological machine sitting here, and that machine powers up and turns on this, you know, consciousness, which says that I am Mosin, I'm a nice guy, I write books, I'm a father, I'm from Lahore, etc., etc. Um, but I'm, I'm aware that the self that I create, that my body creates, um, is at least partly fictitious. Mm -hmm. You know, every so often I behave like a complete asshole, and yet I think of myself as a very nice guy. Why does that happen? Mm -hmm. It's because the story I tell of who I am and the, and the reality of who I am don't always, aren't always in sync. Mm -hmm. There's something fictional about the story that I tell about myself. And when that happens, what we often say is that I wasn't myself. I can't believe I spoke in that way. I can't believe I did that thing. Um, you were yourself. It's just that the self that you were is not the self that you pretend to be. Um, so I think that if the human self is a partially fictional construct, when it encounters the fictional self of a novel, of fiction, and not just of the novel, but of the parable, of the, you know, of the story, um, it encounters something intriguing. Two stories encounter each other. Mm -hmm. The story of the self of the reader and the story that you're encountering. So therefore, I think that stories do have a potential to deal with this topic. Now, um, and also writing, I think, is also about a kind of projection going beyond yourself. It's not just your reality. Mm -hmm. Now, why does that matter? Partly it matters because perhaps I'm you know, terrified of the reality of what it is to be a human being. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, I need something to help me cope. And fiction, writing and reading fiction is, is, you know, is helpful to me. But partly it's because I think that um, in the world today, you know, there is a, a kind of, um, if you're a religious person, you could say a spiritual crisis. If you're not a religious person, you could say a mental health crisis. But it's, in a sense, the same thing. <laughs> and, and the crisis is that, that the various self-mitigation philosophies, religions, practices, traditions that we had, are falling apart because religion is being politicized and as it is politicized it's becoming more about group identity and less about these sorts of questions. The market is about self-interest mm -hmm. and reinforcing the self. It's the opposite of what we're talking about. So that space of self-mitigation is being abandoned on all sides. And even if you look at, for example, sort of militantly atheist position, you know, a militant atheist position very often will say, well, there's no such thing as this stuff. Um, but it doesn't, it very rarely addresses itself to the fact that whether there is or not such a thing as you know, whatever religions are talking about, the human need for that cannot be denied. Mm -hmm. So what is your, then your response to that, let's say if you take that position? If your response is simply, well, you know, grow up, mm -hmm. I think it's a deeply, it's a deeply uh, uncharitable and in fact dangerous uh, kind of a response. And, and if we don't address these, these sorts of questions, I think what happens is we, uh, we live in a world of increasing um, either spiritual poverty or depression, mental health, illness. Um, and in such a world, what begins to happen is all kinds of abhorrent behavior. So I think there's not that much difference for me between the young boy from you know, the tribal areas of Pakistan coming to Lahore and blowing themselves up, up in a shopping mall, mm -hmm. and the young boys in the tribal areas of Colorado going into their you know, school and shooting dead 15 of their uh, schoolmates. Mm -hmm. um, there's a collective failure to address this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I'm intrigued by the idea of the novel as one of many ways in which we can do that. And, and this novel in particular was intended as my attempt to do that. In a sense, somebody once said, it's like a Sufi ghazal in secular form. And uh, I didn't come up with that, that phrasing myself, but it immediately pleased me, that, that, that uh, way of thinking about it. Mm. Thank you. That's a, that was a dazzlingly rich answer. I'm, I'm trying to think about different ways I can pick up some of the strands of what you're saying. Um, so on the one hand, you suggested we have what we might call self-mitigation strategies that are connected to the traditional world of 
spirituality, which of which South India is immensely rich. South Asia is immensely rich. Um, and then secondly, we have um, you know essentially strategies of what we might call self-aggrandizement that are offered by the market, uh, by the global market as well as local markets, advertising, self-help, and so forth. And what you're really plotting out then is a third third strategy, a third space, which is literature itself, and seeing if if fiction itself can provide a kind of an, a secular alternative to the forms of uh, that would provide both a kind of an exposure of the wounds that we have, the psychic wounds, but also the possibility of some kind of healing, perhaps as well. Right? And I want to look at this from maybe two points of view, uh, from two perspectives, because you've you've implicated three uh, figures in this story. On the one hand, the writer. On the other hand, the reader, and on the th on and thirdly, the character, the hero, the protagonist, right? And they're in this kind of complex triangle in any novel, but certainly in this one. And I want to start by asking about the about something a little bit more specific about the author-reader relationship, and then also the author-hero relationship in this novel. And let me begin by asking a perhaps a little bit slightly more general question, which is a, which is one I think that confronts any South Asian writer writing in English, which is the question for whom is he or she writing, right? Is he writing for, I mean, I, I, I recall you saying in, in that interview with Akhil Sharma that you were actually writing for the people you grew up with, which suggests a sort of a local, you know, uh, audience that is uh, literate in English and that can understand more or less the milieu from which you come. On the other hand, it's very clear that you're also, the novels are also projected towards a kind of a global, English-speaking readership that is trying to understand a world that is very remote from their own. So there's a kind of a, the way in which I think so many South Asian novels written in English are suspended between these two readerships that may or may not be aware of each other and of the different capacities of those two distinct audiences. And I want to bring up here a negative example uh, of, of this problem. Uh, and I'm going to mention Salman Rushdie, not by in any way to compare you to him, don't worry. But Salman Rushdie in the Satanic Verses, I think, confronted this problem in a very spectacular and disastrous fashion. Uh, this was in many ways a very uh, complex, controversial novel that is, folk or that is addressed ideally to what I would consider to be the South Asian Muslim diaspora. Right? It's an attempt at understanding what happens, in a sense, to Islam when it's confronted not just with globalized Western culture, but also with the different others of Islam, Hinduism, India, and so forth, the feminine, and so forth, right? And the problem with this novel, of course, is that it was entirely rejected by precisely the audience for which it was ostensibly intended, right? The South Asian Muslim diaspora, which refuses to, or by any large part, to read the novel. And so it's essentially lost the audience of the readership for which it was intended, right? And that, I think, is a real problem when one thinks about uh, you know, what it means to write in English in Pakistan or elsewhere in in the non-English speaking world. So I was wondering if you might tell us a little bit about you know, how you confront some of these problems. I mean, for whom are you writing, and how do you overcome the almost inevitable baggage that comes from not just different cultural perspectives, but also resistances and refusals to understand? Well, I, I, you know, at, a, at a certain level, I, I really don't feel I'm writing for anyone, I mean, for any particular kind of a person. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I I I'm trying to write books that are for everybody, really, mm -hmm. and I write short books so, as a sort of anti-elitist gesture because I think it's less <laughs> scary to people. <laughs> um, so people who don't read novels, the nicest thing anybody ever said to me about Mott Smoke was in Lahore. Somebody came up to me and said, you know, this is my favorite book and it's my favorite novel. That's so nice. But the nice thing he said was. He then said, it's the only novel I've ever read. <laughs> uh, and in a way, that seemed to like, chop the legs out of the first thing. But I thought, oh, that's fantastic, actually. How wonderful that you actually you know, bothered to and felt motivated to finish this book. I was like, that's actually, I still think that's the nicest thing anybody's ever said to me about my writing. And uh, honestly. And um, uh, so, OK, but. So coming back to that, I guess this is, there's a few different things here. One is, um, when it comes to the audience of a novel, it's a bit like the censorship question, in the sense that it can be quite pernicious. Unexamined, if you are writing for, let's say, the judges of the Booker Prize you know, committee, 
uh, which, would be, which would be kind of an absurdity, uh, since you know the, the judges of the Booker Prize Committee are you know just five people like anybody in this room, and it would be insane to try to you know write to them or even to accept that any prize is um, anything more than a very useful marketing opportunity that comes along for literary fiction, which needs it. Um, but let's say you were to adopt this in the back of your head, I want to write to this group. Then all sorts of things begin to happen. Um, let's say you want to write, you know, so that you know some major reviewer in America or just the mass public of Britain or whatever likes your book. All of these things are fraught directions that you would that you go down. Um, but maybe subconsciously they still target you. I want you know millions of Americans to read my book because I want to make millions of dollars from reading my book. Um, but uh, uh, so the way I have tried in my writing to um, to minimize the potential to stray, um, in other words, to write to an audience unintentionally, um, what is by creating frames. So uh, in Mod Smoke, Mod Smoke is written as a trial, mm -hmm. and the presumed judge of that trial is somebody from Lahore in my mind. Mm -hmm. Could be anywhere, but somebody from Lahore was cast as a judge of this trial. But also the reader, right? Yes, yes. who You're is the reader? reader right. Who is the reader? Mm -hmm. um, and so therefore. Everything is written as though the judge is a reader who happens to be from Lahore mm -hmm. judging this trial. Mm -hmm. So what is explained is, is are things that uh, would be worth explaining to a Lahori. Mm -hmm. I won't explain things that are not, in, uh, you know, uh, that a Lahori wouldn't need explaining. Yes, that's true. So there's no italicization of. I, I noticed that. It's very refreshing. Yeah. And it, it's sort of in that sense, it was written for people yes. like me. Yes. But. Only in the sense that that is, you know, I think Gino Diaz, I read an interview with him which, I, which, I, which stuck in my head. One thing he said is that, you know, um, you know, when you build a cathedral, you have to have in mind somebody who comes into the cathedral. What's the, you know, what's the vantage point for your project? But once the thing is built, it's not built for that person. That's just how the architect constructs the cathedral. Then it's open to anybody who comes inside. And that's very much the approach I try to take. I mean, it may not be the approach Gino takes, I might have just completely misunderstood what he was saying, but that's what I think he was saying, and that's certainly what I do, which is, um, so in, in The Rotten Fundamentalist, the main character is speaking to a presumable, somebody he assumes to be an American listener. And so everything is explained as though to that particular American listener. Does that mean The Rotten Fundamentalist is a, is a book for Americans? No. Mm -hmm. It means that the, that the vantage point, the the language being employed is ostensibly for a particular American who's listening to this guy talk. That said, the interaction is an interaction that anybody can watch. Mm -hmm. And in How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, um, my, in my mind, my audience was not particularly geographically defined, mm -hmm. but rather a young person who wants to get rich and who knows it's happening in Asia and therefore wants to read a guide of how to get there. Um, but who hopefully by the end is moved to other places. Now, now uh, uh, again, it's not, the novel is not really intended for young people who want to get rich, um, but, but that, that vantage point allows me to determine, you know, how am I addressing things? What is being explained? What is not being explained? Um, what are the presumed biases that I am implicitly reacting to in the book, etc., etc.? So, in that sense, um, I, I have used frames up till now as a way of giving me a way to write novels that react to the frame, as opposed to the larger world of people to be satisfied or mm -hmm. audiences to be won over or whatever. Mm -hmm. Thinking that if, it's, if, it, if the integrity of the frame is maintained, then what exists is something that can be read by anybody. Mm -hmm. And it also exists in a way that corresponds to what I think, as opposed to my you know, secret desire for white people to like me or whatever. Um, now, uh, uh, so, so that's, that's one half of the answer. The other half of the answer is, you know, about, um, uh, let's say, being read in a place like Pakistan or in the South Asian diaspora. But I'll start with Pakistan. Um, I have never experienced the kind of acceptance um, and enthusiasm uh, as a writer, as I experience when I speak in public in Pakistan. 
you know, uh, at the Lahore Literary Festival recently, you know, I gave a talk and the auditorium was seated a thousand people and another thousand couldn't get in and most of them were very young mm -hmm. and many of them are first generation English speakers, mm -hmm. first generation college students who are cramming these halls and not just for me, interestingly mm -hmm. enough, for many other uh, Desi writers of the English language fiction. Mm -hmm. um, filling these halls and then asking like very basic questions. You know, think, people were saying things like, you know, sir, I moved to Lahore after reading Watt's book. And then everybody started laughing because we all knew there was subtext for I read like pot or I don't know what it is. <laughs> but what you find is, what I find is that what's quite interesting is that um, uh, as, a, as a Pakistani writer, which I am in part, and it's not the only thing I am certainly, but it's one of the things that I am. Um, uh, as a Pakistani writer, a writer who has come to a certain extent from Pakistan and who currently lives in Pakistan, and often writes about Pakistan. Um, it's very interesting to encounter young Pakistani readers, who I don't think of as my sole reader or my most important reader or anything of the sort, but, but, but that means a great deal to me personally. Um, emotionally, it's a very important readership to me. Uh, and, and I think, you know, what, what a lot of these young people, um, and so I, I'm at these festivals or at universities I'll go and I'll often spend hours mm -hmm literally standing outside the hall as one after another person comes up and talks to me about things. Mm -hmm. and, I, and the sense I'm getting is that actually um, the English language mm -hmm. is now being viewed by the mass of, of young students in places like Pakistan um, as a way out of a kind of uh, economic and cultural apartheid into mm -hmm. which they have been thrust mm -hmm. by a non-English language state education system. Mm -hmm. So in Pakistan, if you go to a, to a state school, you will basically not learn much English. Mm -hmm. um, yet our constitution is in English. Mm -hmm. The best jobs require knowledge of English. And if you want to get the hell out of Pakistan, which is the <laughs> dream of many young Pakistanis, um, you need English. So, so many of them get to college mm -hmm. and are desperate to, increase, you know, to improve their English. And so they talk in English. They want to talk to me in English. Mm -hmm. um, they read in English. And they start reading novels in English, and they start with Pakistani novels because it's about oh, well, somebody's recommended check this thing out. Mm -hmm. And then, in the process of reading these novels, they enter a deeply subversive space mm -hmm. where issues of gender, sexuality, politics, culture, you know, spirituality, etc., um, etc., et are being explored mm -hmm. in a way that is not explored very much, or or not explored perhaps with equal, well, I don't know how to say it, but, but it is, they are explored in other places. Not, I don't mean to say they're not explored in other spaces, but are explored in a dramatically... Um, uh, I would say an ambiguous way. Right? Yeah, well, they, 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 they can be explored in an ambiguous way, but in the sense that um, much that goes unsaid mm -hmm. publicly mm -hmm. is said. Yes. And, and so for a young person to encounter these, unsayable things being said or un unsaid things being said mm. is to, you know, particularly if you're a young person who's come from a very different background and is now rethinking what they think about things to encounter all these other writers, not just me, but many others who are also thinking about such things and talking about such things. Um, I think there's a glimmer of, of not just recognition, but of, um, you know, a lot of people embrace this. And so what emerges is actually an outpouring of, you know, I mean, love is maybe too strong a word, but of real affection. And so um, uh, for me personally, nothing is as moving and satisfying as speaking uh, in public in Pakistan to an audience of young people and finding in them genuine interest in what I do. Now, um, and the amazing thing that is, is that there's now a million university students in Pakistan. For the first 50 years of Pakistan's independence, a million university students have graduated in total. There are now a million enrolled at this moment. So a quarter million presumably graduate every year. That's a huge and growing population. Um, now, I'm not saying that these people are you know, all my fans. There's a tiny, tiny, tiny minority who will even ever look at my novels. But in that group of people are some who look at novels either by me or somebody else. And of those some, some will of course hate it, but some will find something of value. And meeting those some, uh, you know, the subset of the subset of the subset, which is still, you know, tens of thousands, maybe more people, 
um, you know, it feels, uh, it feels like there's a point to what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I guess, um, I, I don't have the feeling mm -hmm. of being, you know, an author cut off from, uh, I mean, certainly I'm connected to the international, which mm -hmm. is why you and I are speaking, mm -hmm. but I don't feel I'm disconnected from yes. Pakistan. Yeah. And, and I actually think the success of your novels um, points to a kind of very different sense of what, you know, the English language is doing now in South Asia. It's no longer the language simply of a small privileged elite, but also the language of mobility, the language of, of you know new of a new kind of professionalization and urbanization of the population and of opportunity essentially, right? And I think that in a sense your stories are, are speaking to that. Um, I, I think we're slowly running out of time, so but I actually wanted to ask just one more question, but perhaps we can keep it uh, brief before I turn it over to the to the audience. And it's actually about the the title Moth Smoke and the names of your protagonists. Um, and I, I'll get to the question in just a minute, but for those of you who are unaware of the book, uh, Moth Smoke is a reference to um, the Sufi Urdu Persian uh, lyric tradition where the moth or butterfly, the parvana, is seen to immolate itself in the flame or candle, the shama of, of, of either mystical or, or profane love. And similarly, the three main characters of your novel, uh, Aurangzeb, uh, Dara, Daru, Dara, and uh, Muntaz, are obviously references to uh, 17th century uh, Mughal history. And that raises for me a question. Your novels are very, I think, stylishly often, and even hipsterishly, dare I say, modern, particularly moth smoke. Um, you know, with all of the references to drugs and the extramarital sex and so forth. And yet, at the same time, the novel is in some ways, I, I don't even want to say rooted, but certainly embedded in some traditional references um, to Mughal India, to, and specifically when one thinks of Aurangzeb and Dada Shikoh has, has been interpreted as representing two paths that Indian or South Asian Islam and Mughal history could have taken, right, between piety and orthodoxy on one side and syncretism and mysticism on the other. So I guess my, my last question to you is that there is this kind of interesting cultural baggage in, in this novel, of reminiscences to uh, you know, the Sufi tradition, to Mughal history, and yet all three characters are entirely out of sync with tradition, right? And they're uprooted from it, uh, don't recognize themselves in it, Mumtaz wants to be to realize herself as a woman in ways that are clearly no longer that, that are not available to her as a conventional Muslim woman in Lahore. So there's a kind of I want to suggest that there's both this sort of cultural past that sort of looms large in the novel, and yet at the same time the three characters who inhabit the novel seem somehow rudderless within this this history. And so my last question I guess to you is like what is this? I mean, this is, is this a universal, is this perhaps a universal thing, but this sort of this relationship between past and present, between the Muslim tradition and the postmodern or modern novel, is that something that uh, you could tell us a little bit about before we, we get questions from the audience? Well, I think, um, uh, I mean, in Moth Smoke in particular, you're right, it, it, it very much springs from um, this conflict between Daeshiko and Alanze. Muntaz, the historical character, actually is their mother. Yes. Um, as opposed to the wife. I, I, I noticed that too. Yeah. But, but motherhood itself is interrogated in that novel mm -hmm. quite a bit. Um, so, you know, what exactly she is is, is uh, somebody who chooses not to be a mother and therefore doesn't mm -hmm. play a historical role. But I think partly it was for me the idea that um, to begin with sort of setting up these historical parallels and archetypes and whatever, um, and then finding that, that pieces and people um, fall into their own patterns. So um, setting up this kind of Mughal clash, and not just those characters, but pretty much every I mean, all the named characters, you know, Manucci, there actually was a Count Nicolo Manucci, uh -huh. who's the servant of, of, of historically, of uh, Dara Shikoh, but then joined Aurangzeb's camp and wrote a wonderful account of that, yes. if you have historically. Yes. Um, or even Dilaram, who's this mm -hmm. prostitute who uh, appears very briefly in the novel, there actually was a mystical lady named Dilaraf who was met. So I mean, all of this stuff, but um, but not with the idea of saying that this will be a historically accurate thing, but of saying that there is this kind of weight of history and tradition which surrounds us, which we ignore at our peril, but which we also, um, you know, uh, if we try to reenact, re will utterly fail at. Um, I mean, the Mughals themselves, you know, where were they from, and um, what was their story? 
um, you know, uh, they, they were migrant souls. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And in fact, the history of South Asia is 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 a bit like, uh, you know, the I mean, the, the history of South Asia is a riverine history. That effectively you have these civilizations that grow on the banks of these great rivers, mm -hmm. and um, and how do these rivers work? They work by uh, flooding occasionally. When they flood, the alluvial soil spreads out around them. It deposits itself. It becomes fertile, mm -hmm. and you have these incredibly fertile bits of land all along these rivers, mm -hmm. and they accrete layer upon layer upon layer. Mm -hmm. That's why we have you know these civilizations of South Asia in the first place. And in exactly the same way, human beings have accreted across South Asia, you know, like alluvial soil, layer upon layer upon layer. And you know, as you see this kind of layering, um, you can, and we often do, I think South Asians in particular, maybe everybody does this, we pluck out certain layers. Mm -hmm. And we say that, yes, and we say that this layer is my layer, mm -hmm. yes. it's my caste or religion or whatever yes. we want it to be. Um, and we, we begin to enact it. Mm -hmm. um, now, in the enactment, of course, a lot of these layers or stories or histories do have certain universal resonances, and they can Romeo and Juliet-like, you know, be um, uh, useful models or or intriguing models. Um, but as we begin to um, adhere to them too closely, uh, the fact that you know we are not just that one layer; we are every layer uh, begins to manifest itself. And so, the characters in Mott Smoke, whatever the initial historical impetus which sets them in motion um, remain characters of the modern moment. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, in a sense, wanted to acknowledge and nod to a certain kind of um, historical moment. Mm -hmm. And in particular, a historical moment which has given enormous importance in, in the Pakistani context as to what is our history. Mm -hmm. that, that sliver of our history is, is the part of the history we know best. Yes. And that we, I mean, we, at least in school in Pakistan, um, is you know that along with some other sort of you know groups um, is what we're taught a great deal about. Uh, I mean how well we're taught or how accurately we're taught is something else. But that's the part of the history that gets um, uh, you know from Muhammad bin Qasim to Jinnah. Yes, exactly. And and so um, uh, and so that was of interest to me. Uh, I think that the that the the butting heads of these archetypes is interesting. Uh, but I think simply saying that we are still the same as we were then is, is absurd, um, partly because it may not have, to, well, we are not the same as we were then, and who the hell are we? <laughs> Either them or we, I mean, the whole thing becomes very fraught. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it was, I guess you could say, the, the Mughal historical aspect of Maud's Smoke um, both allowed me to kind of play with and reenact history, um, as well as hopefully. Uh, rebut the idea that uh, uh, history is uh, either necessarily all that believable or um, all that accurate as a guide to where we are or where we're headed. Mm -hmm. Beautiful.